Roll call. Clary Barber. Here. Christelle Pella. Here. Joe Hatney. Here. Linda Hunter. Yes. Carly and Bauer. Here. Lisa Robots. Here. Jeff Crum. Here. Suzanne Bauer. Here. I believe we have instruction from our board attorney. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, this is an application where the applicant is seeking uh, preliminary and final site plan approval and the one variance, and it's a uh, variance from the minimum required off-street parking spaces. And as I understand, Mr. Kelso, they're only seeking one waiver other than two. Uh, that waiver would be for the uh, minimum drive aisle width or driveway width. Um, there's been much talk about the uh, hardship in this matter. And I want to point out to the members of the board that undue hardship is not a requirement for the granting of the variance under the C2 standard. What must be shown is that the application is, number one, it relates to a specific piece of property. Number two, that the purposes of municipal land use law would be advanced from a deviation from the zoning ordinance requirement. Number three, that a variance can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. Number four, that the benefits of the deviation would substantially uh, outweigh any detriment. And finally, number five, the variance uh, will not substantially impair the intent and purpose of the zone plan or zoning ordinance. Relief can never be granted unless it can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and unless it will not substantially uh, impair the intent and purpose of the zone plan and zoning ordinance. The burden of proving the right of relief that is sought by the applicant, it always rests at all times with the applicant. This means that the applicant has the responsibility to set before the board the evidence necessary for it to decide the right of the relief sought, or the right to the relief sought. If the board concludes that the applicant has not met the statutory requirements, it has no alternative but to deny the application. And just so we're clear, I know that uh, Mr. MacArthur had said, it made reference to October 14th. I have October 4th, 13th as uh, a hearing date, not the 14th. Uh, this board will consider the evidence and the testimony that was presented on October 13th, November 18th, December 9th, January 13th, February 10th, and today, March the 10th. Those are the only days where testimony, evidence, uh, any documents that were introduced into evidence should be considered by this board. As I've previously instructed the board, any testimony or anything that it had learned prior to the October 13, 2014 hearing or any advice that it may have received from prior counsel should be disregarded. When testimony before the board is in conflict, the board must decide what the true facts are. The board has the choice of accepting or reject rejecting the testimony of witnesses and were reasonably made, such decision is conclusive on appeal. The burden rests with the applicant to establish the criteria for the grant of the variance and the applicant must demonstrate that the affirmative evidence on the record dictates the conclusion that a denial would be arbitrary. Objections, in order to be sufficient to support a denial, must usually relate to a showing that, for example, the negative criteria has not been satisfied or that the applicant has failed to submit affirmative evidence supporting the grant of the variance pursuant to the statute. As I previously said, that is the duty, that it is the duty of the applicant to present evidence sufficient to support its claim for relief. Thus, the duty to produce evidence falls primarily upon the applicant and upon objectors who oppose the granting of the requested relief. The board has heard from expert witnesses in this application. A large part of the evidence which is produced at hearings is usually factual evidence which is based upon either uh, the personal knowledge of the party testifying or is presented in the form of documents. The board is not bound to accept the testimony of any witnesses, whether they are lay witnesses or expert witnesses, but it may only do so if there is a reasonable basis to, to do so. Where there is conflicting testimony of experts, the board may decide which it will accept. 
Any facts or knowledge you may have as board members cannot be used in making a decision unless members put such facts on the record at the time of the hearing. The board may not use, uh, sorry, may use any reliable source of information concerning any fact or facts upon which it intends to rely, so long as that information is, uh, is made part of the record and interested parties have an opportunity to cross-examine. Letters or petitions in support or against an application may not be considered by the board in the decisional process unless the writer of the letter or signer of the petitions appear and testify. When all parties have presented all of their evidence and testimony, and the members of the board have asked all the questions they desire, the board is then required to make a decision based on the evidence that has been presented. This board must decide this application strictly on the basis of the facts adduced at the hearing viewed in the light of the statutory requirements under the Municipal Land Use Law. This board should not be swayed by the number of people that appear in support or against the application, nor should it be swayed by emotion. It should only consider what was placed on the record by those individuals that appeared before this board. This board is a quasi-judicial body this function is to apply facts adduced at a hearing uh, to the legal requirements of the statute and ordinance and to decide on this basis whether the requested relief can be legally granted or not. This board lacks the legal power to grant variances except in cases where the facts produced at the hearing demonstrate the applicant's right to the requested relief under the terms of the statute. In the case of conflicting testimony or evidence, the board must decide which facts are true and thus has the choice of accepting or rejecting the testimony of witnesses. The standard to be used here is whether the decision to accept or reject testimony is a reasonable one. The board must deliberate in public. You may not make decisions privately or have private uh, discussions amongst yourselves. This board is not obligated to grant the variance or other relief that is requested. It may grant only one portion of requested relief. This board may attack, uh, I'm sorry, attach uh, to the grant of relief certain conditions in the interest of the public, if it so chooses. After open deliberations, this board uh, may vote in favor or against some or all of the application for relief. All voting shall occur after a motion and a second has been made and uh, shall pass upon acceptance by a simple majority. If any member has any questions, they may and should ask uh, the professionals of the board during its deliberations. And I believe that um, Mr. Patterson has some proposed uh, conditions if this board is to look favorably upon the application. This is by no means an indication that the board must look favorably upon the application. The instructions that I've given to you, are there any questions regarding those? No. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I uh, suggest these uh, conditions for the application uh, be compliance with the terms of the City Engineering Report dated August 5th, 2014. Um, and the Hatchmark uh, McDonald Hydraulic Analysis Report dated February 10th, 2014, compliance with the terms of the female consultants report dated August 8th, 2014, submission of all necessary easements and the cross access agreements were reviewed by the Board of Council and the City Engineer prior to filing the same, payment of a site performance bond to the New Brunswick Department of Engineering, submission of a site inspection escrow deposit for engineering inspection fees and amount to be determined by the City Engineer. Payment of all water connection fees to the city engineer, payment of all sewer connection fees to the city engineer, issuance of a road opening permit from the city engineer if required, uh, payment of a redevelopment fee if applicable to the uh, city of New Brunswick, uh, mandatory monetary contribution to the city's tree preservation trust fund, the amount to be determined by the TAC, planning review escrow to be funded for all anticipated post approval reviews, payment of any other fees due to the city of New Brunswick if applicable. Middlesex County Planning Board approval or waiver of same, legal soil conservation district approval if applicable. Um, final site plan to be subject to uh, TAC review and approval. Final site lighting plan to be subject to TAC review and approval. 
all utilities and other site improvements to be maintained by the applicant at their sole expense, all on-site utilities to be constructed underground, all temporary encroachments into the public right-of-way shall require city council approval, all construction staging shall be done on-site unless an encroachment for the same to the public right-of-way shall be approved by city council, tracking pads shall be installed at all construction exits and all street cleaning shall be performed as per the director of the director of public works, replacement of damaged streets, curb, and sidewalks as per the direction of the city engineer. Uh, the applicant agrees to limit the occupancy of all bedrooms to no more than two persons per bedroom for a maximum occupancy of 124 persons. If some bedrooms are occupied by less than two persons, other bedrooms cannot have their occupancy increased to reach the 124 person maximum occupancy. The 124 person occupancy is intended to be a maximum for the entire project, reflecting that no bedroom shall have more than two legal occupants. This occupancy cap uh, shall apply even in the event that the city adopts alternative housing code standards for bedroom size that would increase the allowable occupancy of the bedroom. <coughs> the occupancy cap is volunteered by the applicant as a mitigation of the parking variance. The applicant agrees to voluntarily waive all rights uh, existing or future to on-street residential parking permits as a mitigation of the parking variance. Um, and this one is a little, uh, need some guidance on this one, that the applicant uh, will pay the annual membership fee for the enterprise car share for all residents who agree not to have a car at the project. Um, there should be a uh, time period for this, or this is, uh, uh, goes on uh, perpetually or whatever. I guess something the board should uh, um, discuss and determine what that's going to be. Um, the applicant should provide a, a binding commitment with a car sharing service to provide one on-site car share uh, space, uh, either for a number of years or perpetually as the board decides. Uh, in the underground garage to be constructed for the application, the car share agreement is anticipated to be with Enterprise Car Share, but the applicant will establish the program with any other car share program available if the city in the city of Enterprise ceases to provide the service uh, to 17 Mine Street. If not car share, if no car share is available in the city, the car share space shall be rented as a regular space to residents of the building. However, if another car share program does become available, the building owner shall offer one space for the car share program within 90 days of being given notice of the car share program's availability. Um, the applicant is seeking a, a parking variance um, and the uh, driveway with design waiver. Uh, the applicant stated they are going to comply with the foundation planting um, standard. I do have a question about the, you're giving up the right to parking on the street, present and future. Will that be conveyed in the deed? Is, is a it, it, it certainly can be placed in the deed, and it's also it's an agreement that also goes into tenant leases, so that the tenant can go over and apply it. And my, my concern is that the building is sold in the future, that no, this right is given up forever. It would be, we agree that it's perpetual to the building <clears throat> and a requirement in any sale. Do any board members have any questions? Or concerns, comments, they'd like to get on the record. Yeah, and just mentioned before that, um, related to the, the car share, to determine whether you know, those should be deed restrictions uh, or not, how that exactly should be, uh, be handled. And I'll let Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may? Yes. yes. Uh, I think that unless there is a deed restriction, uh, then the, uh, uh, even if the building is not sold, there would be an enforcement issue that I think would be difficult, especially if the, if the building at some point is sold to another entity. Um, unless that condition is in the deed itself, then the new owners would not be on notice otherwise. So I would ask the board to at least consider that. I would agree, I agree with that. I'm sorry, the applicant would not object to that. Any board members have any questions, concerns? I just want to make a statement, if I, okay. if I may. Um, Earlier, this is for the members of the public that uh, may have some questions about the propriety of uh, myself and a couple of others being on the Democratic uh, Committee. Um, I am a member of the New Brunswick Democratic Organization. I am a committee man in my ward and district. Um, I do work um, the polls from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. on election day, and that referenced payment was uh, like a little stipend for that day. Um, I do donate other time and I do other work in the neighborhood, but it's specifically for election day. And I don't want anybody to think that there's something nefarious about that payment. 
I don't have any specific knowledge of who the donators are to the New Brunswick Democratic Organization. It is public record. I haven't looked at it, but I do accept that small payment uh, for Election Day. And that is the same reason I get payments. Uh, mine too. I think we should talk about the, the timeshare of length, at least. There should be some stipulation if it's going to be conveyed on the deed, or should it be well, if there's no objection by the applicant to have the restriction in the deed, then it would be perpetual. Um, the only question that I have, and if they're willing to agree to it to be in the deed, then I, my question is, is me and Luke, but um, if there's no demand for that car, are they bound by it? Madam Chair, if there is a condition of the approval, which is what this would be, that there be a deed restriction, uh, council would need to make an application to this board again seeking relief from a condition of the approval which would be that they would be allowed to file a new deed excising that portion of the deed which requires them to have the car share but they would have to put on the record and uh, the public would be of course uh, available to listen to the reasons that they want that relief so again in the, the spirit of transparency I think that that meets the, the requirement in, in terms of any problems that may occur, including the fact that, you know, maybe in the future there's no such thing as a ride share for whatever reason, a car share. Um, they could certainly come back before the board, and the board could then make a decision. So it retains jurisdiction and control. Do you have any objection I have no objection to that, I understand. I thought there was another condition that, should that not exist, they would Spot. need to come back to the board, that it would... There were, were related to the car share? Right. Yeah, there are two conditions related to the car share. One was providing the space for the car share. Right. And then uh, Mr. Broder had offer, also offered that he would pay for the annual membership uh, of residents uh, who agreed to not have a car uh, who were living in the, uh, in the project. So if, if a car share doesn't exist, do they need to come back then for relief of that? The way, the way I was crafting it here was if there is no car share in New Brunswick, if um, Enterprise Car Share decides, you know, either goes out of business or decides to no longer operate in New Brunswick and there's no other alternative car share, there's nothing really the applicant can do. Um, the uh, space would then revert to a regular uh, space. And this comes, I was doing some research uh, into this, how these operate. And um, that was a standard from Montgomery County in Maryland, uh, where they uh, have done this, and that is how they, they operated there, that uh, if for some reason a car share program is no longer offered, where this was offered as a mitigation, that uh, the space can be used as a regular space. You don't have to keep it empty, but relatively soon after a new car share program uh, starts operating, they have to put that back in uh, because the uh, basis for what they are saying for it is that that will reduce the uh, demand for the residents to, to have cars. So would this be conveyed in a deed or, or not? My recommendation that it be. That it be, yes. that it be in the deed. Okay, I have another question though. So in, in, <laughs> if this was to be the case, the applicant would pay whatever the base fee is to have the car on premises. If there was a per person uh, fee, he would also pay that. So like, say, say it costs $100 to have a car, and then for every person who wants to use a car, it's an additional $5. I'm throwing it, picking it out of, out of the air because I have no idea. Would that be the requirement then that, that the applicant pay the bare minimum to keep the car there until such time as he applies to have that condition removed if there's no demand. As I understand how Enterprise operates their car share program, that's really all I can um, talk about, is that they have an annual membership fee, I think it's like 50 bucks, and that allows you, you know, Joe Catney, so you can go use their, their car. If um, someone else wants to go use it, they have to get an, an annual um, membership fee. The person is, is then charged, um, you know, a, a daily rate, like you're renting a car to, to use it. What I understand the applicant is offering <laughs> is to pay that annual membership fee, not the daily fee when you, if you want to get the car and you want to go to uh, 
um, you know, Home Depot to buy some shelves for your apartment and you want to throw them in the back of the car, you're paying um, for that. But I think it's really kind of up to the applicant to clarify exactly what they were offering with this. And, and I, I've, tried, I've tried to put it in this as best as I could and to make it right. something that is uh, enforceable. Because uh, that's our concern as, as the staff, is that a condition gets in here and the conditions change a little bit down the road, we want it to be enforceable. But um, I, I was trying to get in some clarification might be helpful. Now, is there a time limit on that membership fee that he agreed to pay, or would that be perpetual as long as he owed owning the building? Or we, we were we were volunteering to pay whatever there may be a, a general membership fee and or an individual membership fee probably annual we're we're prepared to pay that on behalf of if it's for having car share there <coughs> fundamentally we would pay that fee maybe a broader fee plus individual membership fee for individuals who signed up who live in the building and if that that would be perpetual so long as we have car share there we would be paying those Anybody else have any comment or question? Uh, the driveway with do you see any safety issues with the emergency? Speak very loudly. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? That's good. Okay. I just want to thank the public for coming out and expressing their opinion on this uh, application because it helps us shape our opinion of this application and, and uh, just gives us more facts to consider. And I, I think the city and I think any city would welcome new housing affordable housing, particularly in an environment where we have university students. Um, but personally, after listening to all the testimony, um, I still have two issues that, that concern me. And one is um, the parking shortage. Um, 53 spaces, I don't believe, can be overcome by the, um, by the, um, proposals to limit um, permits and uh, that people that would rent there would simply not use a car or have a car. Um, just because you don't have a parking permit to me doesn't mean that you're not going to park illegally and um, enforcement is very difficult late at night um, and when, when you have snow on the roads uh, it's very difficult to come home at 11 o'clock at night and find that there's no parking on the street. And uh, the street particularly has a uh, parking shortage now, and I think 53 um, spaces short is just going to exacerbate that situation. Um, parking, to me, has major impacts on quality of life. Um, and. I think that's probably my biggest concern. And then the second issue that I have is the um, just the, the scale of, of this housing in this neighborhood. It's clearly going to overwhelm the neighborhood, um, just, just in size. And I, I do applaud the applicant for trying to make some concessions in the design, um, but I, I I think that um, there are too many dissimilar architectural features, and um, it's just too big, um, I think. And perhaps um, something smaller would have been more appropriate for this situation. That's my opinion. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments? Um, I actually. Um, believe that the project meets the requirements of the um, redevelopment plan. And uh, I mean, I realize that the, the building is big, and I realize that it has a significant impact on the house next door. 
Um, but I believe we heard testimony that the majority of the properties on Mine Street are uh, not owner occupied. Um, they're in various states of, uh, I shouldn't say disrepair, but different conditions. Um, we have uh, projects from um, Rutgers University that are across the street, around the corner. Um, I think the redevelopment plan uh, addresses not just the next door neighbor, but I think it addresses the entire neighborhood and not necessarily just Mine Street, but um, the, the uh, three areas of the redevelopment plan, areas one, two, and three. Um, I was drawn to this line in the um, redevelopment plan. These controls, regulations, and requirements are supplemented and superseded by the additional requirements set forth in this plan, and that's after talking about, you know, what zone um, the area is in and what um, zoning standards were, were used, and I think it was IN1 is what was first talked about. And then, um, in the redevelopment plan, I also um, looked at page 38, and, um, you know, it says the redevelopment plan supports three key goals in the state uh, master plan, encourage development, redevelopment, and economic growth in locations that are well situated with respect to present or, or anticipated public services or facilities, and to discourage development where it may impair or destroy natural resources and environmental qualities. So I, I don't think that there was any uh, testimony that we were going to impair or destroy natural resources. Um, reduce sprawl, we're in an urban area, provoke, pr promote development and redevelopment in a manner consistent with sound planning where infrastructure can be provided at private expense. I believe the uh, updates are going to be done by the uh, applicant here. Um, uh, and then redevelopment plan proposes a mix of residential education and educational support and commercial uses in the College Avenue campus area that are within walking distance to both rail and bus transit. Um, this will bring me to the parking issue, um, which I have actually some other things to say about, but um, there was like an early on in like some of the testimony that was provided by some of the, I guess, residents, there was um, talk of how far things were. Well, I walk from my neighborhood. Everybody who doesn't know, I'm not afraid to say, I live by St. Peter's Hospital. Uh -huh. um, I walk down Easton Avenue to downtown New Brunswick, weather permitting. Um, so to walk three or four blocks to the Gateway parking deck is not a big deal. In fact, when I go downtown and I drive, I park at the Gateway or I park at the Wellness Center and I walk to wherever I want to go downtown, including up Easton Avenue, because some of my favorite restaurants are on Easton Avenue. Um, so I, I think that our close proximity to the train station, which I've used many times over the years, um, my daughter uses, um, the bus, I, I heard testimony that you have to be a Rutgers student to take the Rutgers bus. I've been in New Brunswick for 54 plus years, and when I was a kid, I used to jump on the Rutgers bus even when I wasn't a student. So I don't really think that that's the rule, so I think anybody can use a Rutgers bus. There's a New Brunswick quick shuttle that goes on the side streets to get you places. Um, there are taxi cabs, but they do cost money. There's the county bus line. Um, these are all things that were testified to and that I'm aware of, so I don't think I'm bringing up any additional information. Uh, please stop me if I am. Um, so they're, they're the objectives, um, the local objectives that are listed in the um, redevelopment plan, I think are met. I, I, there's, there's, you know, walking distance to me, um, I'm not like, the pillar of health, but I'm in decent shape. I, I, I can walk from, uh, you know, a mile from my house downtown. Um, and, and, you know, when you talk about parking and alternatives, I think giving up the permits does make a difference. And I think that if somebody doesn't want to rent an apartment um, that doesn't provide parking, they won't rent the apartment because it doesn't provide parking. Um, but the alternative is they can buy, they can rent uh, or lease. I don't know what the proper term is, but um, there is monthly parking at the Gateway Center. There's daily parking there. Um, I, you know, when my neighborhood gets a little crowded or 
you know, for various reasons. I use the hospital parking deck. I've parked in the deck to, to take my car off of the street, you know, for different reasons. Um, there's alternatives in New Brunswick. So I, I, I think, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, I'm reading the letter from uh, Mr. Lego that says that the parking requirements are flexible. Um, uh, and and the, the one quoted paragraph, uh, uh, factors affecting minimum number of parking spaces include household characteristics, availability, availability of mass transit, urban versus suburban location, available off-site parking resources, which I mentioned. Um, urban versus suburban, I remember Mr., uh, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, Mr. Lidwornia, um talking about the study um, Alabama, Auburn, and Clemson, and I remember well, Clemson, because my two nieces go there. Uh -huh. um, but I, I also know that that, that, that was um, challenged to a certain extent because it appears that in that same study, um, it was brought up that there, the Minnesota model more accurately reflects New Brunswick's uh, situation from uh, Alabama, Auburn, and Clemson. Um, Minnesota model being more in line with an urban setting and I believe the other was there was like two or three miles distance between the campus and and, <coughs> and the housing and and uh, the, the distance was what made the parking requirement uh, uh, a little bit more critical in the uh, uh, I'll say for lack of a better term the southern model model um, I did take um, some, uh, take it pretty credible that Mr., um, I guess, Broder, the applicant, testified of his experience with other projects. I, I don't necessarily believe that just because he did other projects that we should grant him uh, uh, approval on this, but I, I heard his testimony. He has other projects that have uh, limited testimony. Mr. Kelso summed it up uh, this evening that have similar percentages, if you will, unit uh, parking spaces per unit percentages, I think he talked about. And um, uh, we've heard testimony, and I guess it's our duty to decide if that testimony is credible or not credible. I haven't really heard anything to the contrary uh, to say that it doesn't work. Um, so I'm taking Mr. Broder at his word that, that his uh, other projects and his experiences are positive and not negative on that uh, 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 factor. Um, let's see. I think that's it for my comments. Is there anybody else? Um, yes, I also just wanted to thank the public for coming out um, and making sure that your voices were heard. Um, I have heard you. Um, I just wanted to make a few quick comments. Um, I fully support the redevelopment plan of this city. I'm all for this city being built up. Um, I'm obviously a resident and I also work here um, and I understand that when cities are being uh, redeveloped and built up that um, not everyone is always going to be pleased, not all the residents, you're never going to be able to please everyone um, and I, I understand that as well. Um, but I just feel that on a street like Mine Street, um, having a 55% parking de deficit in a building on a street like Mine Street I don't think that that's doing anything for the quality of life for the people on that street or in that neighborhood and the surrounding businesses in that area. Um, I think it just might um, make it worse. Um, and I understand that, um, as Mr. Kelso has summarized, there are um, similar parking spaces per units, um, the, the similar percentages. Um, but since we haven't heard otherwise, this still is um, a violation. And I know that we are asked to be flexible, but it still is a violation at the end of the day, and we haven't heard any real other testimony otherwise as to the success of those buildings and their parking spaces that spaces that have similar um, ratios. So those are my issues that I wanted to share. Thank you.
I'd also like to thank the public for coming out and participating in this. It's been a very long hearing, very interesting to me. Um, I have a problem with the scale of the building and I do not believe it's harmonious with the neighborhood as, as it sits. I also applaud the applicant for scaling it back and making the design changes that he did make. However, I, I don't believe there was enough done to the project and I don't think it fits in the neighborhood. <clears throat> Seeing the shadow study disturbed me because you're taking away just it's interfering with the right of sunlight to the people next door. I, I think that's just, I don't like that. And the parking is an issue to me too. I, I don't know that I agree with the car sharing program. I don't think there's enough testimony, enough information out there that proves that it works. My, my biggest thing I think though is the, the scale and the, um, the scale of the building. Any other comment? Anybody like to make a motion? Well, we have mixed comments, so let's make a motion for approval and see if it gets approved or not. And that motion would be with the conditions previously recited? That's correct. With all of the conditions previously read by Mr. Patterson, including the discussions on the ride share program and deed restrictions that were discussed by the panel. Give me the second. Second. Who may? Yes, sir. I'll second. Yes, sir. Yeah, second. Okay. Uh, Clary Barber? Yes. Chris Stelotello? Yes. Joe Catanese? Yes. Linda Hunter? No. Colin Neubauer? No. Yuzika Rojas? No. Jeff Crum? Yes. Suzanne Ludwig? No. Does not vote, doesn't pass. It does not pass. Game's over. Bravo. Couple minutes for.